So, you wanna tell me that the HBO subject really got your attention, huh? That's great to hear, as we have prepared many more examples of what was pictured in the right way and what wasn't. Last time I've told you a bit about Legasov's appearance in Vienna at the International Atomic Energy Agency's meeting, about the beam of light going out of the power plant after the explosion, and about the party meeting at the bunker shortly after the disaster happened. Today we will start with Legasov, yes, again with him. A big surprise. I think it's becoming kind of a tradition for us here. So, here it goes. Question number 11. Did Valery Legasov have to smuggle the recordings through some air vent near his building trash disposal place? You may remember this scene very vividly if you've watched the TV series recently, for example as me, as it was one of the first in the whole show. We the viewers generally knew what the series will be about, so also that it was one of the biggest disasters in human history. That's why we were introduced to some person, not yet named at the very beginning, who was recording something in a calm yet very sad voice. Then he smuggled the recordings outside his apartment. The feeling that he was observed or scared was an obvious mood trick the director wanted to achieve. The mentioned person was of course Valery Legasov, the main character in the whole TV series. He took a big part in the post-disaster cleanup so we can pretty much understand why a Soviet Union citizen who saw and knew a lot of things, maybe even too much, could feel threatened. Especially when he recorded his own story about this event and its outcome, but in reality Valery didn't smuggle his memoirs. It's true that he recorded those. It's true that he spoke about his own part in the Chernobyl disaster. It's true that he mentioned the lack of knowledge of the reactor's operators. He concluded that Chernobyl was the, quote, apotheosis of all that was wrong in the management of the national economy and had been so for many decades. But the smuggling part was a mere imagination of the show's creator, Craig Mazin. Mazin once said that he didn't find out how Legasov handed the recordings over to his friends and colleagues, so he totally fictionalized it. Question number 12. Did the Bridge of Death actually earn its name, or is it an over-exaggeration? The Bridge of Death is the one that lies between Pripyat City and the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The stories that come with the name are really terrifying, as most of them claim all people that gathered there on the day of the disaster died in an awful manner due to radiation. Even in the series, the people are shown standing on the bridge and being covered in something that looks like irradiated ash, blown away from the power plant by the wind. It seemed like the creators of the show wanted to give us a little spoiler of what will happen to those people. You know, grim music, some details unseen by the TV series characters, but shown clearly to us, the viewers. But then again, this isn't true. First of all, there is evidence that at least few of them lived many years later. Second of all, the whole Bridge of Death story is more of an urban legend, which sounds gruesome yet interesting, but can't withstand a simple fact check. If all people standing on the Bridge of Death on April 26, 1986 died soon after, why other people, in different places, but also close to the power plant, didn't die? Yeah, that's kind of a campfire horror story. But it is true, many of those people suffered from different autoimmune diseases and some of them died prematurely. And now the lucky number, so question 13. Was Anatoly Dyatlov really the main bad guy of the Chernobyl disaster in reality? To sum up all information, Anatoly Dyatlov was a deputy chief engineer at Chernobyl nuclear power plant. So, he was in fact a subordinate of Nikolai Fomin, as shown in the series. But then again, as pictured in Chernobyl, he was rude, obnoxious and proud beyond the normal point. It's very probable that he was counting on promotion, as HBO has shown. So we may understand the reason behind hurrying up the reactor test. The show creators pictured his behavior as one of the main reasons behind the disaster and the fact that he didn't respect any safety rules. And the only thing relieving him partially from his guilt was that he didn't know about the reactor's scrum procedure flow, so the AZ-5 button, that was supposed to initiate it and terminate the fission reaction. But of course, as always, 
truth is more complicated than that. Chernobyl disaster was an effect of many neglections, many different neglections and misinformation. And of course, a political system that was focused more on what everybody else around us will say than on actual real threats and opportunities. Dyatlov was pictured very well if we speak about the actor playing his role, but the role itself was corrupted. One of the actual engineers working at Chernobyl nuclear power plant said that the real life Dyatlov was strict, but nonetheless a highly professional person and an expert in his field. And it is true that Dyatlov, along with Fomin and Brykanov, was held somewhat responsible for the disaster as the result of the trial that took place in the months after Chernobyl happened. And it's also true that he defended himself with a claim that he wasn't present in the control room because he was in the toilet. That was an actual lie. But when we think that he was made a scapegoat to some extent, it sounds more like a desperate line of defense against a political machine that wanted to see him guilty no matter the facts. Question number 14. Did the Soviets try to use robots to clean the irradiated debris? The short answer is yes. It is true that Soviet first tried the moon rovers, two of the STR-1 models. They actually worked and it's mentioned in the HBO production, but it was a small detail there. In real life, it is estimated that these rovers moved dozens of tons of irradiated debris and thus did the work that would need around 1000 more people. So we may say it saved around 1000 additional lives, or at least prolonged it. And yes, it's also true that the rover succumbed to the radiation at some point. The West German made robot named Joker, that got some longer on screen time in Chernobyl TV series, was a real robot too. Actually, most of the robot scenes were CGI, but the show's crew built a working Joker robot that was used while making episode 4. The real Joker, however, still sits in the exclusion zone and there are many photos of him on the web. And it's a fact that Soviet Union lied to Western Germany and gave them the propaganda number. However, the robot worked a bit longer than shown in the HBO series. First, Joker was running and even got to pick up some pieces of debris, but one of them stuck in its tracks. The liquidators freed the track and the robot could work more, but then it failed, just like it's shown in the episode. The other sad truth, mentioned directly in Chernobyl TV show, was that the US had the technology that could help with cleanup a lot, maybe even relieve the liquidators from entering the most irradiated places. But the tensions between the US and the Soviet Union made it impossible for them to agree on working together. They didn't even bother to ask one another about the matter. Question number 15. Did the Soviets actually use biorobots after the machines failed? Unfortunately, yes. After the STR-1 and Joker robots have failed and the politicians didn't even try to ask the Rotten West for official help, the Soviets had to use, well, the work of the people. Or, as Legasov sadly put it in the TV series, by robots. Almost 4,000 liquidators worked to clear the radioactive debris scattered around the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. And it is true that they were given a time limit to make sure they won't get irradiated too much. Well, statistically at least, as we don't know the exact short and long term effects that this had on their health. I spoke about it in one of the previous episodes, so watch it if you're interested in who the liquidators were and what their job at the exclusion zone was. So, that's it for today. Be sure to watch other episodes of Chernobyl Stories series. Check out the playlist, which you can find on our channel. Let's keep in touch, stay safe, and see you next week, guys.